Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Again, welcome to everybody um, and good afternoon. Today we'll be talking about the implications of shape sensing robotic bronchoscopy in a lung cancer practice. Uh, my name is Jenny Nee Reisenauer, for those of you that don't know me, and it's my pleasure to be joined by my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Folk and Dr. Parikh. Um, we'll take a moment here to allow them to introduce themselves, and then we'll go ahead and get started with presentations. Dr. Folk, do you want to go ahead and start since you'll be presenting first? Thank you, Danani. Um, my, my name is Eric Folk. I'm an interventional pulmonologist at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Um, I, I'm honored to be uh, the PI for the study that we will be discussing today. And in my center, I'm joined by Dr. Keyes. Um, it, it's a pleasure to join my colleagues today. Much for being here. Dr. Parikh, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself as well? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Reisenauer. Uh, my name is Mihir Parikh. I'm an interventional pulmonologist at Beth Israel Deaconess, also in Boston, as my colleague, Dr. Folk, um, and equally honored to join you all this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I'm Jenny Reisenauer. Uh, I'm a thoracic surgeon and interventional pulmonologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, today. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the first we'll have Dr. Folk talk to us about the overview of the technology and how the interplay of shape sensing technology with the robotic bronchoscope um, has facilitated our precise post-market study and we'll discuss some preliminary results and cases. We'll then transition into our procedural workflow in terms of how we have used this technology to uh, identify patients, optimize our yield, and finally, we'll close with how this has, um, for better or worse, caused rifts in our current lung cancer practice and how it's become a useful adjunct to uh, our robust uh, lung cancer programs. So without further ado, uh, we'll ask Dr. Polk to take it away. Thank you. So uh, as Dr. Rice and I mentioned, I'll be speaking about the shape sensing uh, technology and our early results of this uh, clinical study. But before I start, I'd like to uh, show you my disclosures. I serve as a consultant for multiple companies, including Boston Scientific, Olympus, and Pinnacle, and I'm a global investigator, uh, global principal investigator for Navigate Trial, as well as the national PI for the precise study that we will be discussing. Uh, I have a, in the past advisory roles for ORIS and in the present with Intuitive. And, but most important is this webinar is sponsored by Intuitive. So when we think of the latest technologies or advanced navigation bronchoscopy, three leading technologies come to mind. Um, two are based on electromagnetic navigation uh, a technology and the third one, shape sensing technology. If you see on the left lower lobe, a very an, an, a, a posterior, you can see a small nodule and that's our target. This is what we're actually a, a thinking of when we talk about advanced navigation technologies. No? On, on the first column, you see electromagnetic navigation based and there we have a, a, the a long standing super dimension system that has um, in the latest iterations, it has a fixed curvature. In other words, you can choose the angle, the estimated angle that you're going to be using for your navigation, and we call this a fixed curvature. The second technology, and uh, one of the robotic technologies that we'll mention today as well, is the Oris Monarch. And this is based on a scope in scope. In other words, you have a wider scope first and from which a thinner and a, lo a long reaching scope comes in. And this is also based on electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy, but it allows you um, a more peripheral axis and a, 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 a different other characteristics that we will discuss further. Regarding shape sensing technology, you have a continuous uh, location and shape, and shape monitoring. As you can see here, the catheter will transmit the information uh, to the software and tell exactly the screen. It will draw in the screen the exact shape in which the catheter and the location in which it is. However, I have to mention that the three technologies are based on CT scans that were done 
a day prior or a week prior, et cetera. So remember this fact because we're using imaging technologies uh, uh, that, were, uh, that were done uh, in the past. In this next image, I want to show you how these leading technologies actually look side by side in terms of their interface. This is the interface of the virtual navigation or what um, the super dimension system shows you as well as the segmentation of the bronchial tree. You create an, a target, you create a navigation plan and this is the appearance on the screen. Regarding the uh, Oris Monarch robot, this is the segmentation that you're going to see on your software and this is the navigation uh, or the virtual navigation. And finally, in the shape sensing technology, you will see a higher level of segmentation in this tree. This is the proximal uh, virtual navigation. But the part I'm most interested in showing is, look at this nodule that is very peripheral in the right low lobe and how you can still see open airways and very clear segmentation in this area. So regarding the progression of knowledge in this field, it's important to recognize uh, how these technologies have uh, come to bear. Um, the flexible bronchoscopy with fluoroscopy, for example, is, is, is with fluoroscopy is more common in, in the US than it is in Europe, but fluoroscopy has been with us for a long time as an as a adjuvant imaging technology. In 98, the initial description of the radial EBUS uh, came about. And in 2009, the initial virtual bronchoscopy or recreation of a CAT scan it came um, into the market. In 2005, the first electromagnetic navigation uh, technology came uh, and it was initially described, it was labor intensive. The first studies were um, with generation one were labor intensive single center and, and variable uh, outcomes, both, both in yield and in safety. But it was identified that there was a, an area of interest that was safe. So fast forward to 2018, Oris Monarch uh, obtains approval from the FDA on a 510K based uh, for their uh, robotic platform. And the first inhuman study with uh, Dr. Rojas Solano in uh, Costa Rica with 15 patients, it, however, where, where no navigation was used, but the Monarch uh, uh, Oris was actually first tried in a human, and this was the publication with very interesting results. In 2019 as well, the largest na a study of its kind, the Navigate study with uh, 1,215 patients was published showing a, a, the widespread application in multiple countries and multiple centers. And finally, in the shape sensing technology, the story starts in 2019 with a 510K clearance uh, of the ION intuitive platform um, with the shape sensing technology. The first in human study gets published by Dr. Fielding in Australia with 29 patients. And again, very interesting study and very interesting results. And the um, precise study or um, the pivotal multi-center trial in six centers, 360 cases uh, that the, the three speakers today actually participate, start enrolling and we learn the technique firsthand. When we start this study, the first five cases of each investigator were not um, necessarily included in the yield, but were actually sort of like a ramping up of our knowledge and those results are forthcoming. An example of the shape sensing technology and the, and the maintenance of the shape of the catheter is, can be seen in these two videos. In the first video, you will see that the, sh the catheter maintains its shape. It's a, it's a 2.1 millimeter catheter that can get all the way to the periphery, to the, essentially to the pleura, and it maintains its shape regardless of the regardless of the tool that you introduce, but also regardless of forces that try to move it back and forth. And in the second video, you will see that despite a very um, a, a tight turn, you're able to introduce your dedicated needle and obtain with, uh, uh, for example, a 19 gauge in a, um, a apical area in the left upper lobe, in a, in a supra aortic arch area, you're able to obtain tissue with a needle. And as all of you know by now the evidence is overwhelming that the needle is definitely the uh, best tool for bronchoscopic biopsy. 
So regarding the study design, and many of you may have seen this before, but it's a prospective multi-center single arm study of early outcomes. Um, the sample size was 360 cases, six centers, and the objective was to look at the clinical utility, both in navigation success as well as biopsy success, the procedure characteristics, the workflow, um, and the learning curve, as well as the early performance, sensitivity for malignancy and diagnostic yield. Why is it important to talk about sensitivity for malignancy and diagnostic yield? Is because, uh, as we'll emphasize, the more precise our navigation is, the more we move towards smaller lung nodules. And as we move to smaller lung nodules, many of them will be benign. So it is important to compare carefully the size of the lesions as well as the safety of these procedures, but also understand that many of these lesions are bound to be benign. Having said that, um, we uh, uh, have the advantage of having experienced users in other technologies in this study. Everyone who participated is a expert in peripheral navigation. So uh, we have uh, the advantage of having close follow-up of this patient, experts in the field, and uh, some of the results will be presented shortly. The, finally, the advanced imaging or cone beam CT uh, that is a technology that I call real time, right? When you activate the Combium CT, you're getting an imaging from today, as opposed to the CAT scan that you're using uh, for your procedure. Uh, that is, let's call it for something historic or a few days old, a week, a week old, etc. Um, now, the results of this Combium CT were not part of the uh, yield and uh, sensitivity that we're pursuing, and it was only uh, uh, used after the actual uh, ion part of the procedure was carried out. These are the investigators, uh, all of them familiar faces to you, hopefully, and you will get to hear from, from three of us today, but we speak for uh, all of us, and um, uh, uh, hopefully, you will find this interesting and in the coming conferences as things start to open up, you, you will see my colleagues presenting their initial experiences as well. So the population that we uh, included in our study, their subjects with lung nodules estimated to be moderate or high risk for lung cancer or metastatic disease. And I will show you an example of why metastatic disease we decided to follow these patients for 12 months. And the key eligibility criteria were that these were solid or subsolid uh, uh, nodules from 10 to 30 millimeters. And you will see that some of the nodules included are barely 10 millimeters. Um, and um, the location beyond the segmental uh, bronchi uh, no endobronchial lesions. If, we, if they were found endobronchially, they, this, the patient was uh, excluded from the study. They, these patients are also candidates for a transthoracic uh, needle biopsy or surgery. And subjects are suitable also, of course, for bronchoscopy in order to undergo robotic bronchoscopy. Uh, we uh, excluded patients with increased risk of bleeding that was not correctable. For example, patients who could not stop anticoagulation or patients um, with uncorrectable uh, coagulopathy. No selection was based on CT bronchosign. What does that mean? That we did not uh, uh, select patients based on the ability to get to an airway where we could see it. It's important in, in this technology to understand that we have continuous visualization up to the point where we get to the nodule at that point, we actually remove our camera and we introduce our uh, biopsy tools. Um, next. These are the locations of the clinical research sites, uh, familiar to all of you. And these are the locations um, of uh, states where actually ION has had a penetration in uh, standard of care devices. As you can see, some centers have actually, uh, uh, or, or in some states have actually started using the commercial uh, uh, ION platform. Uh, this is uh, available uh, for 
use now. And as I said before, FDA clear based on a 510K. However, it is very likely that some of these uh, uh, centers will put forward their single center and their advanced experience uh, shortly. So regarding the first 70 subjects, let me be clear. We excluded the first five done by each investigator. Those were learning curve uh, cases, but uh, they will be presented in a conference soon. But regarding the 70 subjects with a total of 74 nodules that were done, the nodule sizes in the axial coronal and sagittal diameters were 18 millimeters um, 16 millimeters and 17 millimeters respectively with their uh, ranges there. The nodule location, most of them or the majority were in the upper lobes, but they could be in any lobe. We were able to see radial confirmation in 94% of the cases. This could be central, this could be a tangential, but uh, a, a, in, it was quite prevalent that we obtain confirmation by radial EVAs. The mean procedure time, the total procedure time was 47 minutes with an interquartile range of 35 to 67. And the median time to EVAs visualization or to confirmation with the EVAs was 11 minutes. In other words, if you see the difference between 11 minutes and 47 minutes, it means that we were waiting uh, uh, or obtaining further biopsies, uh, uh, waiting for the ROSE results or waiting for further biopsies. In regards to safety, there were no adverse events, no pneumothoraces requiring intervention for 70 cases. Let me be clear, all of these platforms of advanced navigation are safe. However, we were pleasantly surprised by no complications whatsoever that require an intervention. The average in these cases is two to three percent at a meta-analytical level uh, in navigation bronchoscopy. In terms of airway generation, 6.5 was the median with an interquartile range of five to eight, and the distance to the pleura was 1.4 centimeters um, for 57 percent of the nodules being less than 10 millimeters from the pleura. So very peripheral. There's no question about it. And finally, this is a subjective. A marker, but something to keep in mind is in 98% of the cases, we were able to navigate to the area of interest or within two centimeters of the target and we felt confident obtaining tissue. That's not the yield, that's not the sensitivity for malignancy. Those results are forthcoming, but I want to be clear that we felt confident obtaining tissue and we felt confident we were within two centimeters of the leash or, or target. Um, so my conclusion for this uh, initial part of our study is that it is safe. It, it is promising in, in the armamentarium for small peripheral nodules, and these early results are very encouraging for us. So let me show you examples of things we've done, and I have shown in prior webinars and in prior presentations others, other cases, but I want to show you this one. For example, it's an 87-year-old man with excellent quality of life who, um, who's able to shovel snow, to my surprise, every winter in Boston, and we obtained the biopsy using the um, technology put forth with shape sensing by ION, and we obtained the result and, and after discussing with him, he was um, a good candidate for SBRT and he received the plan and the therapy for this so he could continue his excellent quality of life. The next slide. This is one of those cases where I mentioned we, we are interested not in the diagnosis, but in the staging. So you can see that there's a left lower lobe FTG avid lesion that is probably 26, 25 millimeters in its longest diameter. We were not really interested in that lesion. We were interested in the contralateral two small nodules that are nine or 10 millimeters that you can see there in this panel. And we targeted those that are not even um, big enough to be FTG avid. This patient had a history of head and neck cancer, and we wanted to know are these lung cancer lesions, even though it's contralateral, it's important, or are these metastatic lesions from the uh, head and neck? And on the next slide, you'll see that, uh, remember that if, this, uh, if our catheter is 
uh, 2.1 millimeters, and you're able to see the nodules, uh, I'm targeting these two nodules that you see here, uh, multiply that size of uh, two millimeters by three or four, and you'll correlate with the size of the nodule. The other reason you can see them on fluoroscopy is that the, the platform, the software allow, uh, gives you an idea of what is the best angle of the fluoroscopy in order to maximize your visualization of the long nodule. So we were able to get the tissue and um, a, 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 we confirmed with radial levers in this area and, and we were able to biopsy and obtain the diagnosis of, of metastatic disease. And on the next slide, you'll see that after a prolonged procedure, if your mind remembers the prior image, remember, we already biopsy multiple times the initial nodule. Now we move on to the next one and a significant amount of time has passed, perhaps suction. So we have caused what uh, 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 this paper by Dr. Pritchett uh, uh, has called CT to body divergence. And we have caused some degree of atelectasis. So the lesion that was here, uh, the software is telling us it, we are exactly in front of the lesion. We, we actually have had movement of the, or atelectasis, moving the nodule a little more proximal. However, our system allows us to correct millimetrically in order to be head on to it and obtain the biopsy that we need to biopsy. So the, the uh, millimetric precision with which we can move the arm allows us to make those corrections. But keep that in mind, particularly because during the study, we identified that if endobronchial ultrasound um, for, for mediastinal adenopathy was used first, the patient spends more time obtaining smaller long volumes, smaller tidal volumes, we uh, cause uh, secretions or bleeding, and we may uh, elicit or cause atelectasis and be responsible for part of our failures because we are causing a CT to body divergence. So keep that in mind uh, as, as we move forward. And um, finally, regarding this, uh, I will let my colleagues present their cases, but as you can see, the size of these nodules is uh, uh, it, we're going on the right direction. We're getting smaller and smaller in an attempt to, to do this in, in a safe fashion. So with that, uh, I uh, yield the microphone to Dr. Reisenauer. Thanks so much. That's a great presentation. I took multiple notes and, and uh, multiple questions that I'd love to pick your brain on, but we will save the questions um, from myself as well as others on the webinar till the end. For right now, we'll transition over to Dr. Parikh, who's going to talk a little bit about how we plan and, and procedural workflow. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'm hoping over the next 15 minutes or so to give you a good overflow for how this procedure goes, starting with planning, patient selection, and then moving into the nuts and bolts of the procedure itself, just to give you an introduction and a feel for how this actually goes down. I'll share my disclosures as well. I'm an educational consultant for Olympus America, Boston Scientific and Intuitive. So we'll start with uh, patient selection and indications. So as we've already started to talk about the primary indication for navigational bronchoscopy and robotic bronchoscopy procedures is a diagnosis of peripheral lung lesions with an intermediate risk of cancer. Um, and I, I will edit this slide, does not agree with Dr. Folk and that it doesn't necessarily have to be lung cancer that you're looking for. The idea being that, we'll go back to the previous slide for a second, the idea being that perhaps those lesions that are low risk may be better served by follow-up CT scan surveillance and those lesions that are considered higher risk may be better served by proceeding directly to resection or other ablative techniques. There is an additional indication for this procedure in patients in whom you think they might be candidates for things like stereotactic body radiation therapy or cyber knife, fiducial markers can be placed during this procedure as well as dye markings for resection at the time. The only contraindication I think about um, uh, most commonly for these procedures is the consideration that the patient must be able to safely undergo bronchoscopy, including transbronchial lung biopsy under deep sedation. That's where some of those considerations about anticoagulation and uh, anesthesia risk come into play. 
In terms of patient selection, I think we've already started to talk a little bit about this, but one of the conversations I have with patients in clinic when I see them for peripheral lung lesions are the risks and benefits of each of the diagnostic and therapeutic pathways that are uh, in front of them, anything from continued surveillance to proceeding directly to resection. And one of the risks that we talk about with bronchoscopy or biopsy of these lesions is the possibility of a non-diagnostic procedure or non-diagnostic biopsy. And that's particularly the case in lesions that I think are harder to reach, those that are potentially in apical segments that might be harder for us to get up to, um, the absence of a bronchus sign that Dr. Folk indicated has been associated with a lower diagnostic yield in prior studies of navigational bronchoscopy, as well as those lesions that are quite peripheral. And I think, you know, I'll be talking a little bit about the lessons I've learned as my comfort with, um, with ION and my sort of confidence in approaching these procedures using uh, robotic bronchoscopy has shifted over time, I find myself uh, downplaying the risk of non-diagnostic biopsies a bit more, particularly as we get to uh, lesions that I previously thought were harder to get to in the past. And that has meant that I've gone after nodules successfully that are smaller um, without a bronchocyne and way out in the periphery. These are three uh, characteristic patients that I've seen in clinic, each of whom we were successfully able to biopsy using ION. Shifting gears a little bit now, moving to the procedural planning uh, portion. Uh, this is a couple of uh, snapshots from the planning software. Uh, the planning software is uh, similar to prior planning softwares that you may have encountered in the past in that you do identify target lesions and then you navigate or create paths to which you will biopsy them. Uh, this is a, a representative image from the planning software. You get an idea of the degree of airway segmentation that you can get from the planning software. Um, as you uh, can imagine, the first step in planning the procedure is to identify your target node or nodule. This one is in the left lower lobe. The program will pre-populate pathways for you to navigate out successfully to this lesion, but you can adjust those, taper them, um, as needed and add additional pathways as you might. At the left of the screen, it gives you an indication of some of the feedback that you're getting in the planning program. Uh, things including the size in the coronal axial and sagittal views of the lesion, as well as the characteristics of the pathway, both in terms of the distance from the exit point from the airway to the nodule, the proximal and the distal distances, as well as the angle of approach. And that, that's something that's really interesting that we previously haven't thought about, or I hadn't previously thought about in approaching these lesions, because you are able to visualize the airways going out to the point of exit from the airway. An important thing that I try to capture from this planning portion of the procedure is the angle of attack, meaning which way out of the airway are we gonna go in order to successfully target this lesion. And that requires manipulating the airways in three dimension so that you know exactly is it anterior, posterior, lateral, or how best to target the nodule. Um, an additional portion of the planning program that I wanted to highlight was the addition of an anatomy border, something that we haven't seen before. Uh, in this case, this is the pleural surface that we're able to draw into our planning program and that allows us during the procedure to have a sense of how far we are with our needle from the anatomical border that we've highlighted. In this case, it tells you exactly how far your needle is from the pleural surface in many directions as you go out for the biopsy. Finally, do you get to review the biopsy approach itself? Um, and the bottom of the screen, you can see the full pathway that's been laid out to you, as well as the, all the wrong turns you could take before you get to the lesion. It gives you an idea on the top right from the uh, uh, light blue indicators of how far you are from the nodule, both from the near edge and the far edge. And it gives you a good way to understand the virtual bronchoscopic views that you're going to be seeing during the procedure to get a sense of what the airways are going to look like, which particular turns you're going to need to make as you do the actual procedure. A little bit about room setup now. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an indication of how things are set up here at the BI, as well as what an idealized situation may look like, because we may not have that. 
Um, basic people in the room you need are the operator or the bronchoscopist, as well as the anesthesiologist. Uh, in addition to that, you will have your bronchoscopy technician and an assistant. In our case, it's our fellows, um, as well as someone from fluoroscopy as well. I do all of my procedures with fluoroscopy in room. Uh, I put pathologist in parentheses. I use ROSE, uh, meaning rapid on-site cytologic evaluation for all of my procedures, but it's not a prerequisite for this procedure by any means. In terms of where these procedures will take place, they can take place either in the bronchoscopy suite or the operating room. Here at Beth Israel Deaconess, we do all of our procedures in the operating room just as a quirk of how the medical center is set up, but certainly these can be performed in a bronchoscopy suite. So this is the idealized version. I'll just take you around the room of what the room setup is and who the characters are. To the very right is your anesthesiologist with the anesthesia machine um, with uh, the ventilator tubing attached directly to the patient's endotracheal tube. The patient's intubated lying on the procedure bed. Um, to the patient's left is the robot arm itself and the robot arm has then been connected to the endotracheal tube and docked to the patient. In the center of the screen is the proceduralist who has a console in front of her in which she can uh, maneuver and control the robotic catheter, as well as have a visual on the patient himself to keep an eye on how things are going. To the back of the room is the pathologist underneath the black monitor with a microscope at hand, uh, ready to look at uh, specimens as they come out. And all the way to the left is a bronchoscopy technician who can help with docking as well as biopsy at the time. So that's the ideal version. This is what we have. It's a little bit uh, more chaotic perhaps, um, but it's, 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 it's home for us. Um, I'll just take you around the room to give you a sense of how things look like in our own operating room at BI. Um, in the middle of the screen again is the patient, uh, theoretically lying on the procedure bed with a C arm over him or her. Uh, at the very front of the, at the very bottom of the, mon of the screen is the console with which I or my partner will be standing running the procedure. To our right is the robot which would be docked to the patient as well as the screen so we can keep an eye on our navigation but also have free visual on the patient um, to keep an eye on how things are going. To our left is a bronchoscopy tower, which um, is more, most important for us because our radial EBUS console sits on our bronchoscopy tower, and so that allows us to have easy access to that. To the back right is our anesthesia team, and they're able to bring in their anesthesia machine pretty easily to the patient's right side. Little close up on the console itself. Um, it's, a hand, it's a touch screen monitor there on the left that uh, the procedure list has right in front of him or herself. The touch screen allows you to focus on different aspects of the procedural navigation and control the visual screens that you see on the robotic arm on the right. And there are two roller bolas that you can use to maneuver the pitch, the yaw, the angle attack of the catheter, as well as to advance and retract the catheter into the patient. I'm going to take you through a case now of a patient uh, that we saw here at Beth Israel uh, about six months ago uh, and to give you an idea of how the procedure uh, takes place. So this is a 64-year-old former soaker in whom a left lower lobe nodule was found on lung cancer screening CT. And next we have the patient's CAT scan images which show that it was a pretty peripheral um, left lower lobe nodule sitting right above the diaphragm with uh, these mixed solid and ground glass attenuation that was suspicious, but some of the patient didn't want to proceed directly to resection for, so we opted for uh, uh, bronchoscopic biopsy. So we'll go through the procedure itself. I apologize, it's a little jumpy. I sped up the video for the interest of time. Um, and so the patient appears very tachycardic. That wasn't actually the case. And so the beginning of the procedure starts with uh, registration. This is where the catheter is being uh, maneuvered around through the different lobes of the lungs. And the software is then, as Dr. Folk was describing, using the shape of the catheter itself to overlay that shape onto the segmented airway tree that it's created from the patient's CAT scan that was, uh, that was done previously. And so as we march through all the different lobes of the lung, 
the computer is actively using that uh, information and the shape of the catheter to then model or best fit model a shape for the airway tree. Once that's done, we assess the registration, meaning we get a good sense of comparing the virtual bronchoscopic view, that's that shaded gray view on the left, to the actual view, which is the white light view that you see on the right. Once we're comfortable with that, we start navigating out to our lesion down to the left lower lobe and make our way out there. And you, as you can see, we're working our way through smaller and smaller airways and getting out to these distal lesions. Once I feel somewhat comfortable with where we are in relationship to the nodule, feeling comfortable that we're at a reasonably accessible target, I then line up based on my sense of where the lesion is in relationship to the airway. I'll highlight on the top right of the screen, you'll see the optimal floral angle. That gives you an idea of what angle the C-arm should be to give you the best relationship of the catheter itself to the nodule. We quickly miss that, but I do send the radial EBUS out for every procedure that we do with the hopes of attaining a concentric radial EBUS view. And once a concentric radial EBUS view is obtained, we have then uh, proceed with biopsies. I'm just somewhat neurotic about the radial EBUS view in that I do like to confirm that the radial EBUS view is persists after multiple biopsies to make sure that we haven't moved or that the nodule hasn't shifted in relationship to the catheter. Once that is completed, then we slowly retract the catheter and the vision probe from the segment, taking a quick look to make sure there hasn't been a lot of bleeding, which in this case it wasn't, and then we come on out. And then in this case, I believe we proceeded with mediastinal staging with endobronchial ultrasound uh, to confirm that there weren't any nodal metastases. The ultimate diagnosis for this patient was adenocarcinoma of the lung, and she did ultimately go to resection. Um, I agree with Dr. Folk in that needle biopsy is an important part of our armamentarium, but I also feel that multimodal sampling also increases diagnostic yield. So while I always start with a needle, I then do proceed with brush biopsies and forceps transbronchial biopsies at the target nodule in almost all situations. And as I kind of hinted at before, I, I certainly have shifted uh, to some degree that the, the patient selection to target what I previously thought were harder nodules to reach. And in order to do that successfully, I, I have come across either through things that we've developed here at Beth Israel or things that I've learned from my co-investigators across the country who have uh, lots of experience with ion procedures different strategies to help optimize the diagnostic yield. And I'll, I'll share a couple of the lessons learned with you over the next couple of minutes. Dr. Folk mentioned the concept of CT to body divergence. And I think this is an, a, a very important consideration in these procedures. The idea being that the location of the nodule in the plan is based on a CAT scan that happened remote from the time of the procedure. And there are factors that may cause that location of the nodule to shift as the procedure continues, things like local atelectasis, bleeding, changes in respiration. And there are some strategies that may help minimize that possibility. A lot of that has to do with discussions with the anesthesia team to keep the lungs recruited, either with recruitment breaths at the beginning of the procedure or utilizing a higher PEEP to minimize atelectasis as the procedure goes on. The other, I, the other important thing I've, I've, I've learned is always just to keep an eye out for it. I always monitor the relationship between the virtual bronchoscopic view and the real bronchoscopic view, and they should match up really well. If we find that the real bronchoscopic view appears to be much more proximal or closer to the catheter than what is expected based on the virtual view, that's an indication that atelectasis might be developing, and we have to take that into account as we line up for our biopsy. Um, one of my pet peeves I've had with navigational bronchoscopies in the past is that oftentimes I'm training fellows here at Beth Israel and in prior uh, years they've spent all this time navigating out to these peripheral lesions, sent that 
locatable guide, the external working channel out, spent almost an hour trying to find these tiny nodules. And then as soon as they line themselves up perfectly with the ball, they get very excited and start moving all over the place. And with that, sure enough, the catheter moves and they've then lost their alignment completely. Uh, the nice thing about the ion is that, as Dr. Folk was describing, the stability of the catheter is pretty good and that even as soon as I take my hands off the control, the, the catheter locks into place and I am fairly confident that it's not because of any sort of shift that alignment will be lost with the lesion. But important to keep an eye out for it. And finally, you know, precision is, is really important as we try to go after uh, a smaller and smaller, more peripheral nodules. Um, as I've said before, I use radial EBUS for all procedures and a concentric radial EBUS is, uh, is something that makes me feel much more confident that we have uh, achieved a, a successful biopsy. A couple of the tools that I've started using more with these procedures is something called the biopsy marker tool. You can see that in the top left of your screen um, where the blue ball, which is the target nodule, has now been marked with multiple different numbers. Um, from one to nine. And those all represent different biopsy attempts or lineups or alignments of the catheter in relationship to the nodule. And that's something I use uh, uh, to sort of experiment with, try different angles and to find if there is an optimal approach that gives me the best or most concentric radial EBUS image. It's also a way for me to communicate with our pathologist in the room who's doing rows. Um, I can number the slides based on their biopsy number. Biopsy one was location one, two, three, and so on. And then the pathologist can then communicate that information back to me telling me that, look, biopsy angle number two had some suspicious cells, but number three was really the jackpot. Uh, with a lot of tumor. And that, that allows me to then go back to number three and collect a lot more tissue from which to uh, then send off for more testing. So that, that's about it for me. I'm happy to pass it back to Dr. Reisner. I just wanted to share some of the lessons learned and some uh, overflow of the procedure itself. Thanks, that was great. I, I think that having the videos from both presentations really captures what we're trying to explain when we talk about really a truly different way of performing bronchoscopy. So thank you to both of you for the excellent videos. Um, we've already got some great questions coming through from multiple um, attendees. So I'll try to move quickly through my talk so that we have optimal time to, to really answer some of these fantastic questions that have come through. So where I wanted to take my portion of the talk is to talk briefly a little bit about navigational bronchoscopy and the role that that now plays in a lung cancer practice. So these are my disclosures. We can move to the next slide. So currently there's multiple options for treatment for lung cancer. There's obviously surgery and before everybody talked about the risks of surgery, about a big open thoracotomy and intercostal nerve pain and the patients walking around with this massive battle scar from undergoing a lobectomy. But techniques have gotten much more minimally invasive. People are going home faster. Redo surgery minimally invasively is becoming possible. Lung sparing techniques are becoming possible. So, so surgery has really evolved. And I'm not sure that robotic bronchoscopy uh, is going to change necessarily the way that we do surgery. But the ability to now get a diagnosis in patients that are maybe not going to surgery is where there may truly be a role. For example, those patients that proceed on to ablation or radiation, most of the time, if a patient's going to be sent down one of those treatment pathways, people want to prove that there's malignancy there before subjecting them to the harmful effects of one of those two procedures. So particularly as the, as the second two technologies evolve, the need for biopsies may increase. The other caveat to keep in mind is as you look at multiple guidelines across the board, whether they're the CHEST guidelines or the NCCN guidelines, there's no great clear indications in terms of which patients should get a biopsy before we go to surgery. And a lot of times this is subject to who sees the patient and diagnoses the patient uh, before they get to whatever treatment they ultimately pursue. For example, I saw a patient just yesterday at the hospital who underwent a CT guided biopsy that was ordered by the urologist that ordered a CT chest of the lung as part of a kidney cancer workup and sent the patient directly 
to a CT guided biopsy, which was complicated by a bleed and a pneumothorax, and now the patient had to get reoperated on for evacuation of the hemothorax. So, um, you know, there's, there's no clear streamlined linear pathway, which I think sometimes also confuses the patients and providers that are seeing these patients. Next slide, please. So pre a reliable modality of navigational bronchoscopy, whatever that particular modality might be, our my personal practice or our practice here at our institution was to rely heavily upon the pretest probability. We strongly felt that if patients met all clinical and imaging criteria for a malignancy, and particularly if the patient just was coming you know, from afar or either way just wanted to avoid multiple procedures and otherwise met criteria for surgery, we typically take those patients straight to the operating room without a biopsy. If the pretest probability was intermediate, um, or alternatively, I will add, if the patient adamant, was adamant about wanting to prove malignancy before going to the operating room, only then would we consider either a CT guided biopsy. Um, as I said, if there were intermediate pretest probability, we would sometimes even offer potentially observation, which is in concordance with the guidelines. Um, and then only if there were certain criteria, such as a bronchus sign that was present or a larger nodule, would we consider about, consider you know, navigational bronchoscopy, perhaps um, as an intermediary biopsy technique. So I'll show a couple of cases here. I'll pause and show a couple of cases that we've attempted now with the, um, with the ion robotic bronchoscopy system. This first one was a 52-year-old never smoker who underwent a uh, total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy for endometrial adenocarcinoma in 2015 and was rendered NED. She had identified a slowly growing nodule in her left upper lobe on her CT scan, which was pet-avid. Um, the caveat here is that last bullet point, the patient had bilateral DVTs, at one point had a PE on anticoagulation, and yes, had a BMI of 76. So as you look at her CT scan here, you would need a 12 centimeter needle just to puncture through the chest wall and to get to the pleura. And then you essentially would have to transgress a massive amount of lung parenchyma to target the nodule without, oh, by the way, hitting the pericardium if, if you were to inadvertently go too deep. Um, we'll look at the axial and the sagittal views here as you progress through the slides to ultimately show that this is in somewhat of a precarious location. Um, I'm not sure that there's too many surgeons that would be excited to necessarily take this case on and go directly to the operating room to get a diagnosis either. And this is just one more view, once again, showing that this lesion is, is directly sitting on the pericardium, which of course makes it a very difficult location to biopsy. So this is this, uh, just a small video from her case. You can go ahead and play the video and, um, you know, we'll try to talk through the video here as it progresses. Mine too might be a little bit jumpy here as we've tried to advance it rather quickly so that we're not belaboring the point of um, the navigation component of this procedure. Um, you know, atelectasis is a strong concern in a patient of this size. There's data that shows with them being asleep on the table for even 10 to 15 minutes and there's profound difficulty in being able to visualize this lung nodule, you can see that there's quite a bit of variation here with her heartbeat. You can go to the next slide and play that video. You can see there's a quite a bit of variation here with her heartbeat. And once we feel like we've parked in an adequate spot and passed our radial catheter, you can see that there's a, a fairly good signal there, but the virtual target is moving here with the patient's um, heartbeat. And although there are anesthesia adjuncts that you can do to slow the patient's respiratory variation, or to even do a breath hold at times of biopsy, there's not a whole lot that you can really do short of putting a patient on bypass to get a lung nodule, uh, to biopsy a lung nodule, which is obviously not standard of care or practice. You can go to the next slide. Um, so we had to be very careful in how we timed the passage of our biopsy needle. Um, you know, there we had to time it not only with respiratory motion, but also with her heartbeat. Um, this is where the anatomy border was critical because we knew exactly where the pericardium was. This is where having multiple needle size was critical. 
because we, we elected to use all 23 gauge needles here instead of the 19 gauge needles. And the lovely part about having rapid onsite cytology in the room was even though they came back with a diagnosis of malignancy, we had to also distinguish here between primary pulmonary versus metastatic. And so again, using all of your adjuncts, using everything that's in place, being able to burrow through the airway wall and make a small enough hole just to get a tiny forceps biopsy or a slightly larger needle sample to be able to differentiate here, I think is really critical in a patient like this. So the pathology actually did reveal metastatic adenocarcinoma, which was consistent with the patient's known primary. And not only that, we were able to obtain enough tissues to uh, confirm that this was in fact an ER positive tumor. This patient went on to get SBRT and now is on maintenance tamoxifen therapy knowing that she is ER positive and has subsequently had no evidence of recurrence. This case was done, I would say, a, almost a year ago. Second case is a 70-year-old male who had a history of esophageal cancer, had neoadjuvant chemoradiation and esophagectomy elsewhere, and now presented with a tracheoesophageal fistula. So as we were working him up to reconstruct his esophagus, uh, the CT scan indicated a 14-millimeter lung nodule, which was of indeterminate significance. The patient had undergone a CT guided biopsy, which was negative for malignancy, but kind of had these vague terms, such as chronic lymphoplasmacytic inflammatory infiltrate. And uh, the surgeon really wanted a second biopsy that excluded malignancy prior to proceeding because obviously this would be a massive reconstruction for the patient to only have proof of metastasis. So looking again at the CT scan, 14 millimeter lesion, obviously the patient was a prior smoker, obviously the patient has a prior history of malignancy. We'll just show you here in the axial view and the sagittal view on the subsequent slides what this looks like in all three views. You can see that it sits right on the fissure there. And that's perhaps even more clear here on the next slide um, with the sagittal view. Uh, also a fairly peripheral um, lesion and fairly small in size. So I believe our next slide here is some video of the case just to demonstrate what uh, our navigation looked like again um, in this nodule. As you can see, we're driving over to the right upper lobe. Um, and as we navigate over, uh, the, the sidebar on the right kind of tells you as you're getting relatively close to the lesion, which is, which is nice so that you can kind of start thinking about where you want to park your catheter and park your radial ebus probe. In the very beginning, I was driving right up to the nodule and then I kind of learned over time that it probably makes more sense to stay a little bit farther away um, and, and abut the airway wall and then pass your radial ebus catheter. And so here we are taking um, biopsies and marking our biopsies just in case there's a certain area of the nodule that gives us better sample than another. Pathology from this nodule, as you can see, also demonstrated nonspecific chronic inflammation. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask the other panelists for their thoughts on this, but we've had to engage our pathologists a lot more now that we've biopsied more benign nodules and asking them exactly what they're seeing when they're seeing non-malignancy. And are there cell types that are more specific for inflammation that they're seeing, particularly when inflammation is of concern in a patient like this? So this, uh, this patient did undergo reconstruction. His six month follow-up is due for next month, but per the records, he's doing well with no complaints. And when I spoke to him on the, te on the telephone um, as part of follow-up from the precise study, he was doing very well and was quite happy with his results. So, to, uh, so now our algorithm has changed a little bit. Uh, we are still going straight to the operating room. If the patient wants to minimize biopsies, if we don't feel that an EBUS or a biopsy is indicated prior to going to the operating room, and if the pretest probability is eight, greater than 80%. Now, if there's an intermediate pretest probability, we're also offering robotic bronchoscopy as part of the biopsy algorithm. Um, this is not to say that we say yes to everything. There are certain patients that we'll talk about here at the end of this talk that are, I still think, better suited to CT guided, and there are some that I still think are better suited to navigational bronchoscopy. So it's still not a hammer and a nail phenomenon. I still think that there's a role for all of the technologies that are, that are currently available for a patient. 
And so why are we considering more robotic bronchoscopies? Dr. Folk alluded to a lot of this in his, in his talk, but I think we have better reach. Um, Dr. Parikh mentioned less deflection once we get there. It's, we've certainly proven that it's safe. And if the patient's already going to sleep and already having an EBUS for lymph node sampling, there's minimal additional morbidity. Yes, there's a risk of anesthesia and time, but we've proven that those are, those are safe additional risks. If knowing is really gonna change your treatment algorithm or is gonna provide patient satisfaction. And just to put things into context, this was a case that I did a couple of weeks ago, a 76-year-old male prior smoker, rapidly growing, very pet avid nodule. The nodule had almost doubled in size in a period of three months. Um, he was, of course, delayed due to, the, due to this little thing called coronavirus. I don't know how many of you have heard of that, uh, but his care was, was subsequently delayed due to that. Um, he's otherwise got no other oncologic history. And when you look at his scan, uh, on the next slide, you can see that it's a, it's a nodule that was growing fairly quickly. Um, it was located in the right upper lobe. There's a couple more slices here just of the nodule. Um, sat on the fissure, was you know, partially spiculated. This was called a malignancy without question by the radiologist that overread his CT scan. The patient did not want to come for additional test procedure sampling. He just wanted to come and have it resected. So we did, and he had a granuloma complicated by an air leak and spent four days in the hospital before going home. He is relieved to know that he doesn't have cancer. And you know, this is one anecdotal case. I'm not gonna change my practice and send every patient with a lung nodule now to, to biopsy, but it does certainly give you something to think about. So I think the ideal approach to lung cancer, just to close, has to be successful, safe, cost-effective, and collaborative. We'll go to the next slide here. Uh, and I think that part of this is putting all of the members on the same team. There are some nodules that are better suited to CT guided biopsy versus bronchoscopic biopsy. The subsequent treatment that you plan to offer for a patient makes a difference as well. So I think it's really about discussing all of these nodules in a tumor board and having collective buy-in on what do we do if we get a non-diagnostic result, for example, what are our next steps? So, so far, we have done 70 cases, 60 as part of the precise study. Uh, we have done about 10, perhaps maybe three or four more since the slide was created. Our range varies from five millimeters to 32 millimeters in size. And just to allude to one of these questions already, that five millimeter nodule was in a patient that had already had a right upper lobectomy, had a fish mouth totally occluded right middle lobe, and we were going after something in the left lower lobe. And no, we did not have any issues with the registration. We just accepted a partial registration, made sure that our virtual and our real-time bronchoscopy lined up, made sure that our, our um, registration pathway, that white line remained inside the airway, and we got diagnostic. We have cone beam CT capabilities. We have not uh, chosen to do precise cases in that room. Um, and, and if the stars align and we have a robot day and we have the cone beam room, we'll do cases in there. If not, we, for the most part, we feel very comfortable doing cases without it. And I'd also mention that uh, Dr. Sebastian Bussey, who I believe is also on this webinar, um, my colleague and partner down at Mayo Jacksonville has also now purchased the system and is doing cases um, down there in Jacksonville with success as well. Uh, the patients, Seem to, uh, seem to like it as well. These are just a few of the patient testimonials. Um, you know, they haven't really complained about the additional procedure time. Most of the time people appreciate the fact knowing that we were willing to attempt a biopsy so that they can know that they have a malignancy before we recommend a treatment. Just to go to the next slide then. Um, so do I think that the pathway is a little bit more streamlined? Maybe not, maybe we've made it more confusing with throwing another thing in there. Um, but I do certainly think that there's a way that we can consolidate the procedures, the anesthesias, provide a diagnosis to a patient if in fact it's clinically indicated um, and hopefully give, hopefully give everybody on the provider side a little bit of confidence in terms of how to proceed uh, reliably. Um, uh, if in fact that patient does need to proceed to radiation or ablation or something along those lines uh, by means of providing a diagnosis and adequate nodal staging. 
ultimately where this all ties into where the future of lung cancer is going. Um, it, there may be a point where there's multiple robots in the room, one in the airway, one in the chest, and maybe one standing next to the surgeon assisting them with the surgery. Um, you know, I think this is just one small tool in the future of lung cancer surgery, and, and hopefully there'll be multiple more webinars during the span of my career and, and others on this channel to see how we really evolve. And with that, I will uh, uh, thank everyone. I see there's multiple questions. I want to jump right into some of them. The first, I just want to clarify and say that the outer diameter of the channel is actually three millimeters. The inner diameter is, a, is the working channel that's two millimeters in size. Um, I, I think that that was, uh, uh, you know, I just wanted to clarify that before we move on. Sorry, um, Janani. Um, sorry, let me apologize to all of you. I made the mistake when you talk about something repeatedly, these things uh, get ahead because this is a live webinar. So thank you, uh, Eric, for pointing it out to me. You're completely correct. Uh, I said outer diameter 2.1. What I meant is the outer diameter 3.5, the inner diameter is 2.0. At certain segments, it may be 2.1, but you can use any tool through that uh, working channel of 2.0 that that would fit but I apologize it's 3.5 great um, the other the other thing I just wanted to clarify is we we have not released our diagnostic yield information from the precise study because by definition those patients have to undergo a year of follow-up for us to truly say that they were diagnostic or not. So that's why what we've reported today is preliminary navigation success rate, but that is not the overall endpoint of the precise study. And Dr. Polk, if you want to elaborate on that a little bit as well. Sure. Um, David, thank you for, for your uh, thoughtful question. Uh, the two centimeters uh, was developed when the study was designed because we were saying, well, how are we going to give uh, uh, some peace of mind when we're the first ones using this machine in a human, et cetera, in the U.S.? How can we give peace of mind and say, well, let's talk about safety, number one uh, objective, and also talk about in the first few cases, can we get within two centimeters of the lesion? We can talk about that because that's not yield. However, we also set as our uh, definition of, of success for when the final results of the study come out is there's two parts. One is the sensitivity for malignancy, which obviously, as, as, as you know, will be a, a, a very high bar and the yield for obviously benign and malignant disease. So we agree two centimeters is not enough. It, this is just the uh, partial information that we're able to talk about before the study ends. No, um, uh, For the final results, to be honest, I don't know the final answer because I shouldn't be collecting information as we go. I know my yield. I know uh, what uh, we have accomplished in my hospital, but I cannot talk about the six sites because we have not analyzed the information. Um, but we had to have something to go by uh, for obvious reasons. That's great. I'm going to uh, uh, point this question to Dr. Parikh first. Uh, this is a great question that came up from Dr. Kathawala. He says, why not CT guided biopsies for peripheral nodules unless the risk of pneumothorax is very high because of severe COPD? This would avoid the risk of channel anesthesia and cost. Should we be doing a study to compare with CT guided biopsy? And just to tack onto that, there's another question that talks about are we putting everybody to sleep? And we did in the precise study, do we ever foresee a role for maybe doing this in a patient with just conscious sedation and not general anesthesia? That's a great question. And, and I think it's a great point about the comparison between CT guided biopsy to uh, bronchoscopic biopsies for, for lung lesions. It's certainly something that needs to be answered in a rigorous way. Um, you know, I, I, until it's done, though, I, I think there are a couple of counterpoints to that argument about CT guided biopsy first that we've talked about a little bit. You know, I think the first being it's a patient's undergoing a staging procedure with EBUS. Certainly, bronchoscopic biopsy of the peripheral lung lesion should be done at the same time as opposed to subjecting the patient to an additional procedure. Um, you know, I, I also feel that the risk of pneumothorax with percutaneous biopsies is significant. Uh, it, it shouldn't be dismissed uh, as 
as I, I think you know, studies will say upwards of 15% of patients undergoing percutaneous biopsies will uh, develop a pneumothorax, significant numbers of which will then need intervention upon those. Whereas, you know, I think we've seen uh, and we're starting to see that uh, robotic bronchoscopy is perfectly safe uh, with low risk of, of, of pneumothorax. Um, in terms of the, the, the requirement of general anesthesia, you know, our, our procedural practice here has always been to use deep sedation. Um, we use an endotracheal tube in place for, uh, for these precise patients, but we do uh, do other navigational procedures using an LMA in place. I think it's a good question um, about whether or not these can be safely and successfully done, be done without uh, deep sedation or general anesthesia. And I, I personally feel that the diagnostic yield is going to be higher when the patients are well sedated. It just allows them to tolerate that procedure a bit more, minimizes uh, things like cough and other uh, other issues that may lead to more of a CT to body divergence during the actual procedure. And again, I, I think we are seeing through uh, our anecdotal evidence here, as well as hopefully through the ultimate uh, outcome of the precise study that general anesthesia in these patients is perfectly safe as well. Dr. Polk, do you want to add anything to that? I think that that's all spot on. Yeah, I, I, I have to say that recently had a, a, a procedure the first thing in my mind was the safety of the procedure. And when you're talking about uh, a 1% uh, risk or a 2% risk or a 0% risk compared to 15%, 20%, I have to say that I, that was my first question. What is the probability of having a complication? And that complication frequently carries, uh, you know, like a rosary of problems, right? Well, you have to stay in the hospital. Well, you may have to have a chest tube. Well, you may have to have a transfusion. So I don't take the complications of CT guided lightly. However, I think these are complementary technologies. I think there are lesions in which I would prefer, as it has been mentioned before, to have a CT-guided needle biopsy. But when you look at the location of some of the lesions my colleagues presented to you, the lower lobes, look at the studies in CT-guided, and they are not as attractive as upper lobe pleural base nodules uh, um, that we encounter, and there is a selection bias, but I agree, comparative data at some point needs to start coming out. I'll just uh, jump to a couple of other questions. There's multiple questions about being able to reuse the scope. I'll just go ahead and answer that one quickly. The, every, a lot of the equipment is disposable, including the catheter and the vision probe. I believe it can be used five times. There are other components that are single use only, and um, you know we can we can certainly email any one of us, and we'd be happy to send you information on the specific components and 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 what can be used once versus multiple times, uh, and 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 everything gets thrown away, nothing gets sent back necessarily to the company for reprocessing, I believe. Um, some have asked. Um, uh, you know, the, the planning software shows the target pathway, needle exit point, angle. It doesn't appear to show the vessels. How do we get around this? Do we think that the vasculature is important? Is that kind of what you use your radial ebus to help you with? Because that's kind of where I use my radial ebus is, is really to pick apart how vascular something is. And that also kind of helps me decide what needle I want to use as well. Um, Dr. Parikh, maybe you want to tackle this one first? Yeah, that's right. I, I certainly use the radial EBUS to give us a sense of uh, whether or not there are any uh, significant blood vessels around the, the target lesion. Um, and uh, while you can't see it on the sort of airway segmented pathway views, you can certainly manipulate the other, uh, the CT views in the planning program to give you a good sense of where, uh, if any, blood vessels are in relationship to the nodule. And again, that, you know, now that you're able to navigate all the way out in the airways to where you're going to biopsy, and you you can understand, and the, the the program will help you know, you know what is anterior, lateral, posterior, inferior, superior, and the like. You you have a much better way of controlling your needle trajectory in real time in a way that you can thereby minimize vessel hits. Yep. 
Um, just a quick comment. I know we're about 10 minutes over time, but I've been told by the chest group that we're allowed to stay on as long as the group will allow. So um, we're happy to stay on and answer questions until we feel like attendance is really worn off and then, and then maybe we'll cut it short. Um, you know, uh, there, somebody asked, does ION allow you to perform biopsies on nodules that you would have otherwise sent to IR directly in the past? And I think the answer is yes. It goes back to a little bit of what we were discussing. I think there are some nodules that if, if the patient would otherwise also get mediastinal or nodal staging, I would absolutely take a shot at that nodule first because it gives you two answers. Um, if it's a patient that you don't need nodal staging and you're just trying to improve a metastasis, then I would take it on if there's accessibility, availability, I feel comfortable being able to get to it. And I think that there's a reasonable chance I could get to it um, versus if it's a day that we're, for whatever reason, not offering the procedure and there's a slot in the CT scanner. You know, I mean, I, I think there's more to it than, than kind of saying it has to be one way or the highway. Um, Dr. Volk or Dr. Parikh, anything else you wanna to add to that? me here no I, I think that's spot on I, I, I agree I mean there's there's never going to be sort of a, a a way to sort of make this a linear pathway there's certainly going to be indications one way or the other but that sounds about right in terms of my thought process okay. yeah and then even in terms of the molecular analysis that one is a trickier one because um, you know I've seen CT guided biopsies that don't get enough tissue for molecular and I personally have have got nodules where we got we distinguished between lung and breast and uterine, and we nailed it down to breast, and then we didn't have enough for markers because there was so much tissue that was taken to get to that point, there just wasn't anything left. So I, I think that, yeah, having said that, the converse is true too, where I showed a case where we were able to show ER positive um, endometrial cancer. So I think that um, this is, it's really important to know the clinical history of the patient, know that there are some cases where you just need diagnostic, and know that there are other cases that you may need to get lots and lots and lots of tissue because you know there's a lot of analyses that are going to be performed in the background. And and to kind of take a spin off of that, Dr. Folk, can you comment a little bit about how ion has maybe caused an evolution in your relationship with your pathology, not just from malignancy, but also as we start chasing after some of these benign nodules? Absolutely. So uh, first, complementing the question about the moleculars, we have to understand that many of the early lesions that we get asked to biopsy don't end up in molecular uh, testing because they are uh, potentially resectable lesions and thus there's no indication to test for uh, genetic markers of uh, targetable mutations. Having said that, one of the advantages, biggest advantages of bronchoscopy and navigation bronchoscopy and robotic bronchoscopy is that the number of passes is up to you. There is no data to suggest, and the available act data actually suggests uh, that there's no relationship between the number of biopsies and the complication rate. So you can biopsy, as, as Dr. Reisenauer showed you, with multiple needles, with the forceps, multiple times, and you don't have a problem. While the data in CT guide shows a direct correlation be, between the number of biopsies and the risk of pneumothorax. That's why CT guided biopsies try to do the least number of uh, needle passes while we don't uh, mind that as much. So the data uh, that we published uh, even in 2013 regarding bronchoscopy and navigation bronchoscopy shows ex the ability to provide enough tissue by EBUS or by uh, navigation bronchoscopy. So I wouldn't worry about the moleculars. Regarding my relationship with the pathologist, it has improved. It has become closer because I actually have to go see them and say, listen, this is a patient that shows a, a, a benign uh, pattern or an intermediate pattern and look what I found in bronchoscopically or look what the FTG found, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they read to me and they say, for example, you know, I see spindle cells. Uh, you may want to look deeper into this. Uh, if you're okay, just order uh, immune histochemistry or special markers because I suspect this is a bit, uh, this is a, a, a muscle-based tumor like a sarcoma or, or I suspect a lymphoma, et cetera. Now, it also has taken me to them in cases where they said, this is highly suspicious for lymphoma. And 
when I send them uh, more tissue, they say, yeah, this is lymphoma. I would like to have the full architecture. That's not a failure of the navigation, but that is the system of the, the system of classification of lymphoma. So in other words, the smaller we go, the closer we should be to our pathologist and we should understand that there's a relationship between the size of the lesion and the probability of malignancy. So if you uh, get one of these advanced uh, technologies, you are going to be targeting uh, harder nodules and probably you will have more benign nodules, but you will have safe procedures. So um, very little is lost in terms of safety. I agree. I think it just speaks to having that clinical background and context. I think that's what allows you to put the whole picture together. It's not just what the pathology report gives you. Um, question here from Dr. Bussey for Dr. Parikh. He's curious to know what exact measure you, you use to reach that left lower lobe nodule you showed. Everybody talks a lot about CT to body divergence. Were there any breath holding techniques or anesthesia techniques, different things that you have done to try to eliminate that? Uh, obviously, especially if you're not using clone beam CT for these cases. Yeah, and our practice here is not to uh, uh, to use clone beam CT for these procedures. And you know, I, I think so, that we use most of the techniques that I described uh, in my portion of the talk, and, and things that I actually picked up from discussions amongst with my colleagues. We we do you know one of the major practice changes I did uh, was you know I previously staged patients with mediastinal uh, TBNA with EBUS previous to doing that, prior to doing the peripheral lung biopsies, but I flipped that now. So I always do the peripheral lung lesions first, um, even in patients who have evidence of mediastinal adenopathy uh, uh, to minimize the risk of atelectasis over the course of the procedure. Um, we did do a breath hold. We do a, a, a 30 second recruit maneuver um, before we do the registration. And I also asked the anesthesiologist if they feel comfortable aiming for a peep level of you know, eight to 10, whereas previously I believe that they were doing these on uh, like zero peep uh, for our prior bronchoscopic procedures. And then and time is of the essence. You know, I think um, this is one in which we just try to get out there as quickly as possible and, and uh, biopsy it before any uh, atelectasis or bleeding takes place. Yeah, and I think to that end, we should maybe talk a little bit about EBUS and nodule biopsy. I, we didn't mention it necessarily in this webinar, but as part of the precise study protocol, we went after the nodule first before we did our EBUS, as opposed to what many of us do with conventional practice, which is to do the EBUS first and then do the nodule biopsy subsequently. And I think minimizing your anesthesia supine time uh, was really the goal behind that, that reversal of, of workflow. Um, uh, Dr. Folk, uh, question from Stephanie. What do you feel makes ION unique compared to other lung biopsy platforms? Has it made a difference in your clinical outcome? And how does that 47 minute procedure time compare to times with other technologies or prior technologies that you've had experience with in the past? So uh, uh, let me dissect this. Uh, I have to say uh, the ION platform at my institution is currently only being used within the scope of this study. So it has uh, uh, changed my uh, willingness to go after smaller or more difficult or previously complicated procedures, right? To the surprise of the sponsor, I've sometimes done cases that had prior complications with CT guided or prior bleeding complications with another technology. And I've included these patients with excellent results. Having said that, all the patients I've done have been within the scope of the study. So that limits uh, the generalizability of, of all my comments right now. No, I ha they had to be between 30, uh, 10 and 30 millimeters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, regarding the, um, I'm sorry, the second part of the question was. The, how do we feel the 47 minute time compares to other technologies that we've used in the past for navigation? So there's a learning curve here. I have to say that prior navigation platforms have been exposed since their early generations. So I, I'm an avid uh, advanced bronchoscopist in that sense. I, I, I enjoy it. I do it relatively fast. And in terms of published data, I have limited data, but I would say it compares uh, uh, similarly. And most of the time is not 
in both platforms, the old ones and the new ones, is, is not during the case, but it's actually waiting for the uh, rapid on-site evaluation, which in some centers I've joked in the past is slow on-site evaluation. So we sort of like continue biopsying multiple times until we get a read. Um, and and the safety of these technologies allow us to do that without a concern. But, but I have to say, it, it, when I first met the technology and my first case, I chose an easy target and I quickly developed confidence in moving with smaller and smaller nodules. But I think 47 minutes uh, uh, with an answer, it's a very good time. As you saw, 11 minutes to the radial EBUS image, it's very good, right? It's to the point from the time that the scope goes in to the time that we get radial EBUS confirmation, 11 minutes, I think it's very, um, interesting or, or very favorable. I agree. Dr. Parikh, do you want to comment on the time and then also talk a little bit about the learning curve as well and how you anticipate that that will change? Yeah, no, I, I agree with, uh, with where Eric was saying that I think a, a lot of it, a lot of our delay does happen with uh, the, the rapid onsite evaluation, which can take time for processing of specimens as well as, you know, communication back and forth between us and the pathologists, whereas navigation time usually is not the, the, the big delay. In terms of the learning curve, there certainly is a learning curve, and as with any procedure, and I think it, it you know, I, I think it, it's hard to know how to describe that learning curve for any particular individual, but I think, you know, it, it requires, um, uh, a, a number of procedures with which you know you need to understand uh, how to use the technology to give you the, the the best way of understanding the relationship of the catheter to the nodule and and you know as I go along and, and in these conversations with my colleagues I pick things up all the time about things that I previously didn't even understand or realize that that the, the system was trying to tell me or, or how I could fine-tune these techniques um, with it. Um, and, and, and to that end, you know, I've enjoyed conversations with my colleagues and, and the feedback that I've gotten from the procedures to really understand how best to do that. You know, it, it'd be an interesting study to do uh, as sort of an adjunct to the precise to actually get a sense of over time how each of us has developed in terms of our diagnostic accuracy. I imagine the data is there just requires us to be a little bit more forthcoming about our individual uh, success. Yeah, I think what I saw is that initially I was diagnostic for every single one and then I started to get overconfident and pick smaller and smaller and tougher and tougher things and then my yield went down for a little while. And then and then you start employing some of those tips and tricks that both of you have described and then slowly it starts to kind of creep back up again. Um, and you're right, it would be interesting to study that in, in everybody to really get a sense of what the learning curve is. Um, a couple of questions here. If you don't see malignancy on the on-site path, is your practice to routinely send for microbiology? I would say not routinely, but if there's enough of a suspicion there for granuloma, I, I do, uh, or infection, I do, um, at least the washings, if nothing else. Um, maybe we'll have both of you comment, starting with Dr. Polk on that question. Same here. If my suspicion is infection, I will send microbiology, but if it's benign, I sometimes send washings. I'm uh, the yield of biopsies for small nodules for micro is, uh, you know, leaves a lot to be desired. No. Yes. Um. Planning CT specification. So this one, this one, I'll get on a little bit of a soap dish about because we, uh, our routine practice ten years ago was everybody got a five millimeter CT scan for a lung nodule, and then somewhere along the way it changed to one millimeters, and then as a part of the endoscopic lung volume reduction, we started asking for 0.75 millimeters, and then the precise study came along and we started asking for 0.75 millimeters. And our radiologist finally got so annoyed with us that now every patient with a lung nodule gets a 0.75 millimeter CT scan here at our institution. And I found that the more definition that you have on your CT, the more airways that you have, the more options you have, and the more pathways you plan, which I think is better for your overall success. Understandably so, not all patients come uh, from your institution. Some people come from elsewhere. Um, and maybe I would ask both of you this, and I'll start with Dr. Parikh and, and Dr. Folk, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. 
are there patients that you would consider a repeat CT scan on, not just because of how long it's been, but also because of the CT specifications? Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you that I think the more definition you have in the scan, certainly the, the airway segmentation is going to be better and your diagnostic accuracy is going to be higher. Um, you know, I, I think it all, uh, we, we here in Boston have tend to have patients, I imagine, from most other institutions as well, coming from varying distances away. So a lot of it is oftentimes based on logistics of what they're coming in with and what scans they've had done before. Uh, but certainly, I, I like to aim for scans with at least 2.5 millimeter cuts and you know, generally with that level of um, of, of distance, you, you, the, the planning software perfectly accepts those those scans, and you're able to plan from them uh, with 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 success. Um, so I, I tend not to uh, repeat a lot of these CT scans as long as they meet the specifications of of the study, which is what we've been doing here at Beth Israel. Dr. Folk, I'd love to hear your. Uh, similar experience to what you guys have said. I think our radiologists have gotten into higher and higher precision with the slices. Uh, something interesting I've noticed is that sometimes they obtain very thin slices, but what gets put on the actual clinical um, uh, medical record, they are uh, a little thicker slices or less frequent slices so they can read it faster. I've seen that where I go to the radiologist and I say, hey, any chance that you can repeat this CAT scan because I need more uh, slices? And they say, no, no, the raw data, I have raw data for one millimeter cuts. I just put this up in the medical record, but let me get you the raw data and we can reconstruct what you need. That's one thing. And, and um, the second uh, important thing is sometimes when you use uh, the lung cancer screening protocol, you may have, if it's a follow-up, you may have a limited CAT scan that just focuses on a specific area of the lung. And in those cases, we do have to sometimes repeat the CAT scan. Uh, fortunately, it's a non-contrasted CT and, and that's easy to obtain. And, and let me, the tail end of this is someone's asking, how is our uh, uh, institutions interested in lung cancer screening, I have to say that it's important to look at nationwide. Only 4% of eligible patients in the US are undergoing lung cancer screening. Only 4% only of those who would qualify and who would benefit from the uh, advantages of lung cancer screening. I can only see this going up and up. And, and um, I, I, I'd like to see what you guys uh, have seen in your practices but there is interest uh, in my patient population. I agree. I, I think that it's only increased um, our experience in terms of patients coming here for lung cancer screening and, and, um, and asking about uh, options that are available for them. Um, would, would either of you be willing to make just a quick comment about the robot and, and shape sensing and how you feel like that particular technology has, has changed your practice in any way, in particular the robot component and the shape sensing component? I can start, you know, I think the, 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 the robot component, I, I think it's, it's important to emphasize the stability of the catheter um, and, and, the, and the ability to finally maneuver through, you know, increasingly small airways as, as I think we showed in the videos that we had before, that you are able to maneuver this, you know, this very small catheter through tiny airways with incredible precision. Um, and, you know, I, despite me being an interventional pulmonologist, I honestly wasn't really that good at video games growing up. And then, you know, I, I have found that even with my fumble, like uh, fumbling hands, been able to control this catheter very easily, um, you know, despite there being a learning curve over time. Yeah, I have to. I have to agree. My my experience has been one where my selection of cases is more and more uh, broad. In other words, I I pay attention for nodules, and I find very rarely do I say, well, let's let's repeat the CAT scan um, in in three months and see if if this is a more doable procedure, right? When I get referrals from my radiologist, for example, and they say this is a high-risk patient or this is a high-risk nodule, I find myself more and more comfortable saying, oh, we'll target this. It's similar to an example that you guys showed with a nodule that is attached loosely to the pericardium, 
or the diaphragm where there's a lot of movement. And, and when we do multidisciplinary uh, long nodule uh, clinic, I say, yeah, I, I think I can reach that confidently. So it has definitely changed my practice, both the stability precision of the robot and the shape sensing technology, giving me the, the information of the shape and location of my catheter. Um, I, I suspect there will be a shifting like the one we have seen. seen when you compare the data of CT guided biopsies in 2004 uh, and you compare it to 2015 and you see that we're biopsying more nodules with CT guided, but certainly we're biopsying significantly more with advanced bronchoscopy like electromagnetic navigation. We're going to see also a quantum leap in now in, in uh, robotic bronchoscopy playing a role. I would agree, and I would I would say not only is it making those nodules that we were previously going after those three mil, three centimeters, two and a half centimeters bronchocyte and present, those are so much faster and so much easier to do. To where now we're looking at smaller, farther out, no bronchocyte, going cross country, all of those other additional components. Um, we're, we're, we've already gone about a half an hour over the allotted time, so unfortunately I have to close the discussion here. Um, there, there were a couple of unanswered questions that we didn't get to, but um, feel free to email any one of the three of us if any other subsequent questions arose that we couldn't answer and we'd be happy to speak with anybody um, offline. I'd like to thank the CHESS group once again for this tremendous opportunity as well as that uh, of my esteemed colleagues for being on this webinar today. Uh, and to all the participants with the, a great discussion to follow. Um, so thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.